Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa. So, Today we are starting new sessions on teachings is we explore the Dhammapada in different themes. And uh, the version the version of Dhammapada that I'm using is by uh Bhikkhu Buddharakita. And uh, so you can actually download that online. Uh, on the web is free, or you want to get a paper copy like this. You can also get the paper copy over Amazon or any online. So Dhammapada is actually a very important uh, literature or, or very important uh, uh, co compilation of teachings, especially in the Theravadan tradition. Um, when the Dhammapada was uh, was compiled, because the, uh, the Dhammapada verses are actually very very simple verses, so in this book there is really no. Um, oh, they do have some some um, index index, but there is not much of explanations. But if you look online. There are actually a lot of um, explanations or commentaries on Dhammapada. Uh, since I have actually taught the whole Dhammapada many years ago, uh, um, 10 years ago in English, so I, we are not going to actually go verse by verse. That's why I said exploring the Dhammapada in different themes, in different uh, uh, chapters. So. Um, in the Dhammapada, you, you can actually see uh, there, there are 23, uh, 26 chapters and 423 verses using the Theravadan tradition, the Southern tradition. But in the Northern tradition, that means in the Chinese Mahayana tradition, it's actually quite different. So but I'm using the, the, the Southern tradition, the Theravadan tradition which inside there are 26 chapters and 423 um, verses. And, uh, but some of the verses are all um, compiled uh, or, or can all be studied together, understand, understand together. And so in the whole Dhammapada, among the 423 verses, there are actually over uh, about 300 stories. Okay, 300 stories. Um, some of the stories are actually very commonly known and commonly used uh, in teachings. Uh, for example, um, uh, Angola Mala, Angola Mala story, or example, uh, Kotami, the, uh, the woman, the woman um, wh whose son has died and the, 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 um, the Buddha asked her to go out for a sesame seed. To go out to get a sesame seed. Those are those are very very commonly uh, known stories and very commonly used stories. But each verse in the Dhammapada, even though how simple they are, it seems to be actually carries a very very deep meaning. And and the Dhammapada, if you if you don't study anything else, I just want to study the Dhammapada. It's definitely enough. It's definitely sufficient. Uh, it's actually more than sufficient uh, if you can actually put the Dhammapada, the theories of Dhammapada into practice, into the daily life. Not just looking at it from a literal point of view, but actually from a practical point of view, from a, from a, a practitioner point of view. It's, this is way, way over. It's way, way sufficient. It's more than sufficient. And so uh, that's why I always rec recommend um, 
students or, or friends to really keep a copy of Dhamma part of clothes um, uh, wherever they, they are and you know constantly use it as a reference to help themselves overcoming difficulties um, when they experience in the life with themselves or with the outside world or with people or with relationships or whatever you know and just use the Dhammapada to help themselves to overcome those obstacles and to return back to this present moment and start anew. So uh, I could say the Dhammapada is actually among the Buddhist world and among non-Buddhist world is one of the very well-known um, um, sutta. Um, I, could, I, I could actually compare the Dhammapada to the Heart Sutra the Dhammapada being in the Theravadan tradition, but the Heart Sutra being in the Mahayana tradition, and even non-Buddhists are very familiar, very fond of, 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 of Heart Sutra. Uh, so I could, uh, you know, uh, it, it's so that, that's how common and that's how well-known Dhammapada is. So, um, as I told you last time, the Dhammapada, what's it meant by Pada? Pada means the, the footprints, right? The footprints of Dhamma. And of course, the footprints is actually the footprints of the Buddha, or the footprints of Buddha walking on the Dhamma path. So, um, in, in the Dhammapada, you, ca you see all these verses. Actually, those verses actually correspond to a certain particular um, life situation that the Buddha uh, is in or his students were in and then they, they came back to ask the Buddha um, what happens and why and you know whatever and the, and the Buddha actually teach in this way, give them the verses, teach, taught them in verses uh, and of course <laughs> in the Dhammapada um, this is a very common question from many people is you can you can see is uh, oh once the bhikkhus heard what the buddha said they attained enlightenment they attained sotapanna they attained um, uh, arahat and and all that and uh, a lot of people have 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 doubts about that why why would why would uh, in the old days when the buddha taught this and um, why would people become so en enlightened so easily? You think it's easy because you're just reading the stories, but you don't know. You don't know how much work these people have put in through eons of life. And then they, they come to a place where all these merits and virtues were ripened at the time of, you know, ripe, right kind of ripeness. And so that's why when, when the Buddha gave them this shot, it's just hit it right there. So <laughs> it's not that easy as you think. <laughs> it is actually way, way more difficult. And there, are, there, are way, there were may, way much work that these people have done. Uh, it's not what we, we, what we perceive is so simple and straightforward, okay? so. Uh, at least, but this is a start for all of us, right? What kind of themes are we going to look at? Uh, I have so made out a few themes. Maybe I will change it uh, along. So the first one is human life is rare and precious. And the th second theme coming along is self-control. And the third one coming along will be... Third one. Oh, I can't see it. Uh, cause and effect, like karma, and then happiness. And happiness, yeah, we could we could actually look at it from happiness of this life or happiness of future lives. So good friends, self reliance, and follow the Dharma. These are the few themes that I I may I may touch on, but uh, you know, I may I may change along the way. But um, but definitely. Today we are going to look at this. The first one is human life is rare and precious. When I talk about human life, we always think of ourselves. Right away we think of ourselves, our human life. But 
whose human life do you think is the most precious and the most rare? And the rarest, or rarest or most rare? Most, most rare, yeah, R-A-R-E, right, three, yeah. So whose, whose life is the most rare and most precious? Okay. The Buddha. Yeah, the, the Buddha's life um, is actually up to now, <laughs> I think, up to now, to, to, a, to, a, to a student of the Buddha. I think having our teacher born into 2,600 years ago, I think it was the most rare and the most precious to us. Even though we did we don't have a chance to actually meet him personal on in, per, in person, but yet his teachings, we are surrounded by his teachings and uh, his teachings are, are readily accessible, especially nowadays in this, in this um, yeah, um, fast ele a technical way, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so we are, we are actually, uh, I think we are very fortunate to really encounter such a being, at least in, in our lifetime. So up to now, this, this is um, the most um, rare and the most precious. And we could actually look at it from, from Dhammapada, verse 193, okay? 193. I will be jumping here and there because um, I am picking out verses that actually um, correspond to the theme that I'm talking about. So verse 193, is, it says, um, or maybe I should tell you the story about this first. Um, uh, so the story about this, this, how this verse actually came about was, uh, the Buddha was at uh, the Jetta, Jatavana uh, Monastery, and the Buddha actually said this verse with a question that was raised by Ananda. One day Ananda, Ananda was wondering, thinking, the Buddha, my, our teacher, has constantly told us that, you know, thoroughbreds of ele elephants are born and they are only among the, 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 best, the best breeds. And the best breeds of elephants there is Chandanta and Uposatta. Uposatta, yeah, the Uposatta as Uposatta. So those are the wonderful breeds of elephants. And then there are the thorough breeds of horses, which is the, the Sindh breed, okay? And then the thorough breeds of cattle is Osaba breed. So the different kinds of thorough breeds of different kinds of animals. So Ananda thought, the Buddha kept talking about these thorough breeds of, of elephants, horses, and cattle. But he, none, he never taught about the thorough breed of men. So after, after pondering on this and reflecting on this, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't find the answer. So he went to the Buddha and put this question to the Buddha. And the Buddha actually replied to him with this verse. And this verse was, hard to find is the thoroughbred man. Of course, he implied the Buddha, right? And he is not born everywhere, okay? And where such a wise man is born, that clan thrives happily. So, so that clan, the, the Buddha was born into the clan of what? Katya and Brahmana. So his family was one of these noble, noble clans in, the, in India. So the Buddha said, it's very difficult to find a thoroughbred breed of men. Of course, 
right? If anybody, if any man is not enlightened, if any man is not totally liberated from the or from the from the fetters, and it's, it's not called a thoroughbred, right? So he said he's not born everywhere, because it's hard to find a Buddha. And how many eons of life has gone by? How many eons of years have gone by before Sikkimuli Buddha actually became Sikkimuli Buddha? And after he went into Nibbana, and how many eons we have to wait until the next Buddha, Maitreya Buddha, will come into life? So, of course, he's not born into everywhere. He's not born into everywhere. And where such a wise man is born, that clan thrives happily. Why would that clan thrive happily? Why? Why? <laughs> because they have a Buddha there. That is a very good answer to a question. <laughs> why, would, why would a Buddha born be, you, you, that clan would thrive so happily? Why? In the future, yeah, yeah, because the Buddha's teachings allow us to cultivate happiness this life and allow us to cultivate happiness in next life, right? That's why that clan would thrive happily this life and next many, many future lives, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so, so this is, this is the verse that tells us, wow, the Buddha is the most thoroughbred man. And how lucky we are, and how rare, and how precious is that, right? And also, the happiness has many faces, and the happiness or the blessings have many faces, and we can actually look at that. That, that that's make it also precious. And we can look at verse 40, Verse 40 is, it said, blessed is the birth of the Buddhas. Blessed is the enunciation of the good Dhamma. And blessed is harmony in the Sangha. And you can see from these first three uh, uh, sentences, it actually tells us, blessed is the triple gem, the existence of triple gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And blessed is the spiritual pursuit of the united truth seekers. That means any practitioners who is seeking the truth, who is walking on this path towards the ultimate freedom and happiness and total liberation of the sufferings. Those are the truth seekers. And blessed, they are the, the very, very, I mean, strong blessings there because of the birth of the Buddha. And with the, with the birth of the Buddha, there comes the teachings. And with the teachings, because the Buddha created uh, the Sangha, and the Sangha are the monastics who allow these teachings to be carried on through lives after life, life after life, generations after generations, generations after generations. So that we are very blessed to have these triple gem in our life. We are, it's very precious to actually encounter this. So while, while, we, while you know, um, and, and, and we need to realize that we are literally being blessed by, by having the Buddha as our teacher, by having the teachings that he actually passed down as our guideline to how to live our life. So this is how rare and this is how precious all the, 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 the birth of the Buddha and, and for his teachings. And also to have a Sangha, um, monastic Sangha, you know, um, still around. And you could see I could see, not you could see, 
I could see, I coming from the East, I, I, I was born and raised in Hong Kong and I became a monastic while in Hong Kong. And I saw, I saw how, how the Buddhist teaching flourish in, in, in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in Southeast Asia. But yet, the, the, when the teachings come to the West, the tradition starts to actually take a very different look. Take a very different look. And, and, and of course, being a monastic is actually not very easy. And a lot, it's very difficult to really um, have that kind of determination, devotion, to really let go of householder life and take on the monastic life. It's very difficult, very challenging. And living in the Sangha is, is the most difficult thing to, to, most difficult life situation you can put yourself in. Um, but I tell you, the most difficult, the most challenging is the most opportunities that you have to really practice, to put your practice into practice. To put, to put what you have learned into practice. But I have seen that coming into the West. I, I, I started you know, I, I start living in, in the West for, for the last 28 years, and I've seen this. It, it has taken a very, very different um, shape. And, uh, and, and sometimes I worry. I worry about what? I worry about the monastic Sangha disappearing in the West and being um, taken over by householder Sangha. I do worry, but I know I, I, don't, I shouldn't worry. I should not worry because um, what is meant to be, meant to be. But, um, you know, I think my worry is quite reasonable, right? Right. Um, but of course, I, 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 I I hope that it won't happen. I hope that, you know, there are more and more people would actually devote themselves to to take on a um, monastic life, uh, so that um, the sangha, the monastic um, sangha, will will continue to thrive, to um, flourish uh, in the West. Um, so. So, uh, so this is this is what the the, uh, the arising of a Buddha, the opportunity to hear the teaching, and the harmony um, among the bhikkhus or the bhikkhunis. We can see these two. We can see from these two last two uh, passages, the birth of the Buddha to this human world is truly a blessing, and is truly very very rare. Uh, so the Dharma of with the birth of the, of the Buddha and his compassionate vows from eons of life, he taught the profound Dharma to human beings, the Dharma of seeking happiness. So in order for the Dharma to continue to prosper, just sit down. In order for the Dharma to continue to prosper, the Sangha who, what, well, the Sangha what was created way, way back 2,600 years ago has a, has a strong meaning, has a, has a, has a meaning to, to, to be here. Why? Because relies on the Dhamma, relies on the monastic to spread the Dhamma. And, and, and also the Sangha is actually um, so that monastics or or monastic support the householder to practice together, to learn together, to grow spiritually together, and to propagate the Dharma to others in whatever capacity that they can. So you look at this, this is actually a, a, a very, very strong blessing indeed. But for me, to, when I look at these verses, um, I was so, so touched by these verses, but I don't know how you feel about these verses. Okay, now is your time to speak. Anybody has any, any sharing about these two verses? 
it's verse 193. And, and the last verse was um, uh, 100, no, that was 193 and thoroughbred was, yeah, 193 and it was 40. I, I got the number wrong, I think. Yeah, 182, I think. Yes, 182 and 193. Uh, this one is 182, uh, no, 193. This is 193 and this is 100, no, no, 182 is the, yeah, 182 is the arising. Oh, I typed it wrong. Darn. Never mind. No, no. Blessed is the birth of the Buddha. Blessed is the enunciation of the good Dhamma. Yeah. 194. Yeah. Yes, 194. Sorry. 194 for replacing verse 40. Okay, so anybody has any, any, any <coughs> feelings? Get, pr please use the mic. Laurie, yeah, Laurie has some sharing. Um, yes, definitely feelings. Uh, I. I just feel such enormous gratitude to the Sangha because without the Sangha, I would be lost. I would have had no con contact here mm. Oops, with the Dhamma. Mm. And um, I, ca I can't imagine not having um, Sangha in the West now that it's here. So I just feel very grateful and I want it to flourish and mm. Uh, mm. want to continue to support the mm. Sangha. Mm. So. Good, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, it's funny that we're talking about this today. Just this morning I was talking to my partner Bruce and I said, I don't know how much I can progress on this path in this life, but I have a wish that I get enough of the seed enough of the Dharma in me that no matter where I'm born next life, I hope I can encounter it again. Yes. Whether it's the West or the East or whatever the circumstance, but yeah. I, I hope I can again and encounter it earlier. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> that's in the past, don't worry. Let them go. Let them be. Yeah. Good. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I, I think, I think you, you, you folks here in Chilliwack are sort of... Um, have a connection with us way, way back, many years of life. Otherwise, I mean, look at, look at how many of you are here and how many of them actually do not really have a Sangha to, to be with. And even though the Sangha is here, but look how many people actually come, right? So, yeah, yeah. So anybody, any, anybody from you have, any 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 feelings about these two verses? I tell you, this is, this exploring the Dhammapada is not just me to talk. You can read all the stories uh, online. I'm not going to tell you all the stories. Why why would these verses come? Why would this verse come? I want you to actually contemplate and reflect on these verses. That's why I said it's exploring Dhammapada. It's not just you know, reading or knowing the stories of Dhammapada. Anybody else from the, from the TV squares? Nora. Nora, yes. Yeah. yeah. There you go, Nora. Ever since I encountered the, um, the teachings that it's made like, um, it makes, more sense to me. Life makes more sense. Mm. I was, um, I, um, you know, before when I, I was brought up, um, 
with the United Church, who are yeah. very liberal minded. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Still, I just, uh, you know, just all the teachings of the Old Testament and all that, they, they, they just make no sense to me. <laughs> right? And, and, and this, you know, and like a hard God that's killing people and doing all sorts of horrible things. And, and, and this just makes so much sense. Yeah, right. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, great. And you know, when you yeah. this, if you think about karma, and you, uh, you, you know, you understand that. It just, you know, it just makes life easier, I think. Uh, clearer. Yeah, yeah, clearer, mm -hmm. right? Make the path clearer. And when, yeah. you, when you need to choose, um, make an option, you, 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 there is, you know, you have ways to, to choose, oh, this or this. This, I will be like this. This, I'll be like this. You know, you can weigh, weigh in. Yeah, good. Great. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Okay, so I wonder if what the text refers to, the Buddha's clan, is just a, a metaphor. Of course, it's a metaphor. Yeah, and that clan is not just like one particular clan, like the Sikh clan or the Katya or the Brahmin is us, us, we are the clan. We are one of the clans, those who actually encountered uh, the Buddha's teachings is one of the clan. Uh, that's, that's how I see it, okay? All right then, so, so the arising of Buddha and the um, opportunity to hear the teachings and the harmony against the Tsongkhya is a blessing indeed. So you know, in our in our mundane human world, or in our human world, we think anything that is rare is precious. We call rare stone is precious, isn't it? Right. And in human under, in the Buddhist understanding, human life is rare and precious, not because of being uh, like a being really rare. <laughs> right? It's not rare. How many, how many, how many people in this world? There are like how many? How many? What's the population in the whole world? Right? It's not quite rare. Look how many people we have here tonight. Ten here. Right? So it's not quite rare. If you want to bump into some people, you just go into the mall. It's not rare. <laughs> right? So it's. Even though you, you go into deep mountain, you, you bump into you, you bump into people. People go and ski and, and hike, and it's not rare. But what does it mean being rare? Is the immense potential it has a human being has in order to improve not just this present existence but also for future prospects. The potential, that potential is rare. So in the Theravadan tradition, of course, they are seeking for the fruition uh, in the, all those attainment stages. But in the Mahayana tradition, it's talking about the Bodhisattva path, the Posato. So, Either in either of these uh, 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 in either of these traditions, it has a very strong emphasis on on cultivating paramita, paramis, right? So in the in, in the Theravada tradition is ten paramis, and in the in the Mahayana tradition is the six paramis. It doesn't matter whether it's ten or six; it really doesn't matter. It's really what matters is the cultivation, the development, the perfection of paramis. So if we practice this lifetime in, in the Theravada tr tradition, we wish that in the next lifetime, our seeds will ripen and we continue walking on this path of, of fruition. Or in the Mahayana tradition is we vow, we vow to, bring, to bring peace and harmony and compassion and, and, and loving kindness to, 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 to all beings because we think that all beings have the same Buddha nature as we do. And that is the Bodhisattva. 
and we want to help the suffering beings to be liberated from, alleviated from their own suffering. That's the Buddha's self of our path. And it's life after life, life after life. Okay, that's, that's, that means in the future you want to be a Buddha self too. Not just to attain your own attainment. Okay, so, so in one, uh, so we look at this in 182. Oh, darn, I think I got all the verses number wrong. <laughs> okay, so there is this Naga king and his daughter. I think you probably have heard about that before. And this Naga king and Naga, Naga king was one lifetime. He was a, a, a human. Um, he was a bhikkhu. But he, because he wasn't very smart, <laughs> and uh, he makes mistakes when he was a bhikkhu. It was not a very, it was not really a very, really strong mistake. But he broke a blade of grass while he was traveling on a boat, and he constantly bashed himself with this mistake. When he died, he became a naga. Uh, 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 you can call it an, a dragon. And then uh, throughout his many lives as a Naga, he, he wanted to, to encounter the Buddha. But he didn't have the chance. And when he, because he was a Naga, and in, in, the, in all these stories, uh, they always say that all these Naga and whatever, they have supernatural powers. And this Naga had a, had a daughter, beautiful woman. And uh, because the Naga king wanted to meet the, the Buddha again so that he could actually uh, seek penitence or he could actually ask for teachings from the Buddha so he could be free from being a Naga. So he wanted to find the, uh, he wanted to find the Buddha so he used his daughter his daughter was very beautiful, and um, uh, once a month, his his daughter would come out and say, um, uh, ask a few questions. And the Naga King promised anybody who could answer these four questions, he would allow his daughter to marry to marry that person. And so one day, there was this young man called Utara. Utara, Utara was walking towards this, um, this venue where this daughter was, where this woman was. And uh, he wanted to, 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 to give some answers. He wanted to marry this beautiful woman, Naga's daughter. But at that time, the Buddha actually, in his meditative state, he saw this young man was ripened enough in virtues, merits to receive his teachings. So he appeared in front of Uttara and taught Uttara the teachings. And Uttara, right there, he attained the first fruition, Sotapanna. And then, but Uttara was on the way, so the Buddha said, yes, you should go, you should keep going to meet this woman but you will actually encounter these four questions. When you encounter these four questions, and you really should answer in this way. So what kind of questions? The first question is, who is a ruler? So the woman put that question to Uttara. So tell me who is the ruler? And Uttara said, those who could control their senses, the six senses, is a ruler. Ruler, not ruler, not ruling the outside, but ruling the inside, our own senses. So that's why with meditation, we learn being mindful. Being mindful of all these senses coming in through our sense doors and not reacting with craving or 
anger or ignorance. Ignorance, that means you are so misty and hasty, you don't know what kind of, <laughs> what kind of sensations are coming in, what kind of smell, what kind of, you know, you just sort of like blank and, 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 and foggy. Or you, you react blindly. Okay, so who is this ro ruler? That means somebody who can actually rule over their own senses, not by force, not by force, not by suppression, not by oppression, but by really being in this space, being mindful and accepting and very balanced, equanimous. And then the second question is, is one who is overwhelmed by the mist of moral defilements be called a ruler? So Uttara said, no. One who is overwhelmed by the mist of moral defilements is not to be called a ruler. Instead, one who is free from craving is called a ruler. So one who can actually subdue his own craving is called a ruler of his own of his own mind, okay? So the third question is, so what ruler is free from moral defilements? And Uttara said, the ruler who is free from craving is free from moral defilements. So anybody who is free from craving is actually free from moral defilements. How could they, how could they commit any moral defilements? if they have no craving, right? If there is no craving, how could they, they be angry? Right? Understand? Okay, you agree? Okay, good. Then the qu full question is, the fourth one is, what sort of person is to be called a fool? We all are fools. <laughs> Right? So who is called, who is being called a fool? A fool is somebody who seeks for sensual pleasure. It's called a fool. So after hearing these questions, Irakapata, that means the Naga king, knew Buddha was born. Buddha is here now, right in this right in this world, right at this time. Therefore, he begged Uttara to take him to see the Buddha. So Uttara actually took him to see the Buddha. And Buddha uttered these verses to him. He said, hard is it to be born a human being. It is very difficult to be born as a human being. Look at Look at this world. There are more animals than human beings, right? Look at this world. So it is difficult to be born as a human being. And hard is it, the life of mortals, really. We all have to die. We all have to die. And it's, it's, it's really, sometimes it's very difficult to face death and hard is it to gain the opportunity to hear the good dharma i totally agree with this because i mean i have been here 28 years and uh, i look i look back all the time to to the time that i have spent here and i and i look at the the, the size of our congregation i said Whew. there must be something wrong with me. <laughs> or, you know, I'm not doing enough or whatever, that, you know, the, 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 the congregation is not expanding. Of course, there is this craving in me that this congregation should be expanding. But, but I think it's really not the time yet for a lot of people 
in the West to hear the Dhamma. That's why it's not expanding as I wish it, it, it would be, you know. But hopefully in, 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 in the future it would, it would be. Maybe I won't be able to see that, but it's okay. And the uh, heart indeed is to encounter the arising of the Buddhas. So you can see it is really material-wise human beings are able to accumulate wealth very easily. But how can we accumulate wealth that will lead to future happiness? Because when we die, all this wealth will be gone. All the wealth that are come, uh, or that we accumulate, material wealth. How can we accumulate that? What kind of wealth should we accumulate in order for future happiness? What do you think? What kind of wealth? Anybody? Jeremy, yes. Uh, <clears throat> a wealth of karma, living a wholesome life and, and full of good deeds. Yeah, yeah, good. Good deeds, wholesome life, yep. Good deeds, yeah, Claudio too, yep. Okay, anybody else? Um, Sifu, I was just thinking... Um, uh, for quite a while now, I've been uh, looking around my home and at all the things that I've um, valued and treasured for so many years, and I've carted around with me all my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at them now with so such uh, different eyes, and I think, oh, you know, it won't be very long. I won't be here. I wonder what, you know, these meaningless things, where will they go? And Maybe they'll all end up in the landfill. I don't know. But th the, the importance of them is, is not there anymore. And mm. it's, everything has shifted. So and renunciation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, uh, I feel like it's uh, a, new, a new life. Mm, good. Yeah. Good. Really Even nice. at this old age. Yeah. <laughs> renunciation. Yeah. Different type of renunciation. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Sifu. Um, I think the few of us have been actually talking a little bit about this, like um, about <laughs> about death coming and how um, how that changes things. And I was talking to my parents, and they have this trailer down in the U.S. And they really enjoy going there. And my dad said, oh, well, this weekend we have to give it a break. But, um, you know, we're going to go as much as we can while we can. And the way he said it, my heart just sank Yeah. hearing it. Because I thought, yeah. oh, like, oh, you're over 80. And, you know, relying on the, even though it's not like, they're not going down there the, to drink or do <laughs> bizarre things. They're going out there to be, you know, beside a campfire. But they're still relying on something that requires them to be in a certain physical condition, and it's mm, not, mm, you know, it doesn't mm, last that long. Mm, so mm. accumulating, w when I heard that question, I thought wisdom, I, not that you can accumulate wisdom, but to have a better understanding of what leads to happiness. Yeah. yeah. In order to actually accumulate that kind of wealth that you can use in the future lives. Of course, renunciation is, is important. Of course, detachment is important. And one very important, actually, parami is generosity. Generosity. And uh, because the more you give, the more you get. Um, Chinese saying is se tak. The more you give, the more you get. And of course, we give not because we want to get. 
you don't, if there is an intention of getting things, that's why you give, then you won't get it. But if there is this intention of really developing this potential to be generous, not, not, don't, 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 mis, don't misunderstand the word of generosity. It's not just on the mundane sense. It's not just money. It's not just material. Remember, generosity of a smile, generosity of a helping hand, generosity of burying the rabbit, generosity of your time, generosity of your sharing. It's all generosity. Do not misunderstand or do not actually um, make this generosity too stingy. Generosity is very big, I tell you, it's very big. It's not what we think, it's generosity. It's way bigger than what we think, what we perceive as generosity. Okay, so that is really very strong factor for future happiness and wealth is generosity. Like I'm teaching, I'm cultivating generosity. You are sharing, you are cultivating generosity. It's the same, right? Yeah, into wholesome, Claudio said, pouring one's heart into wholesome activities is cultivating generosity. So, so it's actually, that's why, that's why in, the, in the Mahayana tradition is that even though you understand a stanza, or just a few, few phrases, phrases, and then you are able to, to spread it out or to write it or to talk about it or to chant about it. And when people hear it, when people see it, when people just encounter it, that, that is so meritorious. So if we want to really achieve freedom from sufferings, which is the most wonderful thing to achieve, isn't it? To be liberated from sufferings. And, and we need big resources to achieve it. And these resources are built up by cultivating those parami. And, and generosity is one of it, very important. And, and also, the human rebirth is the biggest, actually, is the biggest resource. Having a human life is the biggest resource that we can have in order to enable us to achieve that goal of liberation from sufferings, attainment of ultimate freedom and happiness. So we having this human life we have all this in, in our human life, but whether we are able to use them is a different story. Okay? So, like, um, I always look at, um, you know, the, the developing worlds, the developing worlds like um, Africa or some other, uh, some other places. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of times they don't have anything. And if you can, if you, provide them with little things, they're so happy already. They don't have that kind of craving as we living in this world with so much surplus. And so when, we, when, we are, when we're living in this affluent world, we, 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 a lot of times we don't treasure. We don't treasure. And, and like people immigrate to, to, to from, from developing world to, uh, to affluent country, they think, wow, how, how lucky I am. How lucky that I am to be able to, to live in an affluent uh, world and to have plenty and to have work. But us, born into an affluent world, we don't treasure it as much as they do. Yeah. I was just thinking earlier, you talked about um, the West and the East, and I think that we're brought up, well, there's a very clear mindset of independence and 
survival of the fittest and that individuality in the West. Yeah. We don't see ourselves as connected as a bigger part of society or the planet, which is more so like we think, I, from my experience, we think more collectively as a society yeah. in, in, the West, in the East. In the East. In the East. So to be generous is, is not even to be generous, it's natural to support yeah. not only it's your natural. family but society is, yeah. is, is as normal. It's the same as yeah. supporting yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas I think that's a, a slight difference here. Very different. Very yeah, different. Very different. Yeah. But anyway. So yeah, how is it to be born as a human being? Because human being has got all the ingredients to make their food, to make a beautiful plate of food. But yet, a lot of times we don't make full use of those ingredients. Sometimes we even ruin those in ingredients, don't we? Yeah? And uh, sometimes we put too much salt in. Sometimes we put too much uh, sugar in and we ruin the, 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 the dish. Because, what? We're not wise. And so um, I want to share with you, um, this is actually very touching. I, I, I don't know whether you can see it clearly on, on screen, but it's like actually a very touching uh, picture. It's a Buddha, um, uh, a Nibbana, um, lying on his right side, went into Nibbana. This is a very famous painting in Japan. And of course, there are actually many, many, many paintings all over the world about the Buddha going into Nibbana. So, um, I want to, to actually pay attention to this, to this here. This woman is very, very old woman. It was said in the stories, in um, actually, um, uh, about this old woman. She was once very young and beautiful. And uh, she was trying to find the Buddha and wanted to listen to his teachings. But in the old days, it's not like nowadays, so, so convenient. Six o'clock, you, you zoom in, then you, <laughs> you meditate. Okay, seven o'clock, you zoom in, you listen to the teachings. 8.30, mind you, it goes on to 8.30 tonight, okay? And 8.30, you zoom out, you're back to your, to your old life. Huh? In the old days, no, people have to walk, people um, go on horses, cattle to travel, right? If they are, if they are well off, they have, they have cattle, they have horses. Um, but if they if they're not well off, they walked, right? They 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 went on foot. So he she wanted to listen to the teachings of the Buddha. She heard about the Buddha. She was looking for him all the time, all the time. And time goes on, goes on, goes on. And eventually, he became she became a very old woman. Look at her, all wrinkles, and and all the hairs were gray and white and. And then she looked everywhere, she couldn't find the Buddha. When, when she became old and she actually arrived to Kushinaga, where the Buddha actually went into Parinibbana. So she was in the vicinity of Kushinaga and uh, she heard that the Buddha was in town. So she was very excited. So she actually um, walk much faster into town. And so she asked around in town how she can find the Buddha. So people actually pointed her to the forest, but pointed her fingers to the forest, not with joy, not with happiness, but crying and, and, and grieving and lamenting. And she was wondering why. So she didn't bother to ask, so she walked and f walked very fast. And when she went, when she got to the, to the place of the forest where this uh, sala tree were, she saw the Buddha lying there, lying down there. And then 
she saw people crying and weeping and beating themselves and throwing themselves on the ground and screaming and everything. It was like, like a horrendous picture of grief there. And so she walked up. She walked up to the platform where the Buddha was lying and she walked up to the, to the feet. And that time, people told her that the Buddha has gone into Parinibbana. The Buddha has passed. And she realized, I spent the whole life looking for the Buddha, wanting to encounter his teachings. And now when I managed to find him, he went into Nibbana. She was all broken. She was broken heart. And she cried and cried and cried and cried and non-stop crying. She broke down and cried. Why did she cry? Because when she was young, she never had the opportunity to listen to the Buddha's teaching. Now, when she got so old, at last, she actually came into contact with the Buddha. But yet, there was no more opportunity to hear him taught. That's why she cried. Such a sad and heartbroken thing to be, to hap to be happening to this old lady who was once very young. So now we, now in this modern world, we are sitting here 2,600 years later. You and me did not have any chance to encounter the Buddha in person. But yet, we had the blessings of encountering his teachings. This old lady did not have. So I'm really lucky. And because we are human beings, we are able to understand. And we are able to practice his teachings. But whether we are able to use his teachings to change our future life is a different story. So you can see encountering the Buddha is very hard. Able to listen to the Dharma is not as, not, not as easy. But we have it now. Right? Aren't we, aren't we fortunate? Isn't our human life precious and rare too, in that sense? Right? What do you think? What do you think? Anybody? Nobody? Huh? Jeremy? Yeah. Um, I have a question, Sifu, about about this. Would and I know it's kind of in a retrospect, like looking back on something. But would that wo old woman have been better served to have tried to um, be be giving and generous and and living wholesomely? or striving to, in, to encounter the words of the Buddha. Of course. She, she's, of course. That, that, like, well, of course. I mean, I'm telling you this story so that you can reflect upon yourself, about yeah. yourself, about your own encounter, encountership with the Buddha's teaching. Right? You can always argue, oh, she doesn't have the, the virtues, she, doesn't, she did not have enough merits. It's not important whether she had enough merits or not. It's important to understand the story so that we can actually contemplate about our own life, our own encountership with the Buddha's teachings, our own blessings. 
right? Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. Steve. Yeah, that is how, I mean, yeah, this is the teachings it's about. So at least in this lifetime, we are, we, we are not born as a, as a cat, as a dog, as a, as, a, as a bunny, as a fish, as a snake, right? As a turtle. We are born as a human being. We are able to study. We are able to read. We are able to understand. We are able to analyze. We are able to investigate. And we are able to put effort in. And most, most very important is we are able to practice so that we know we can change and we can correct ourselves. No, no matter how much you learn, if you are not able to correct and change yourself, that's nonsense. That's useless. It's useless. Of course, it's useless now, but of co hopefully in the future, you will, you will be able to, you know, to actually um, uh, understand a little bit more and then able to reflect a little bit more and able to wake up way much faster and, and, and correct yourself way much faster. Okay, so that needs really strong, strong practice and strong mindfulness and really cl clarity of mind. So that's why uh, as I, I, I see from all these verses is to be born as a human being is actually very rare. And, and, and also because we as human beings is precious is why? Because we are able to know that our life is at stake all the time. And we will be able to convince ourselves or try to convince ourselves well, I better, I better practice more. <laughs> I better improve myself better. I better change myself right now. Otherwise, tomorrow I may not be here anymore. Who knows? But only us are able to know that life is impermanent. Not with a fish, not a turtle, not a dog. Only human beings are able to comprehend this impermanence of life. Right? Okay. So, why is human life precious? We talk about that. Human life is precious because, why? Because humans have this potential. Have this potential to understand themselves, to change themselves, to correct themselves. Because why? We have this consciousness. We have this mind. And we, because of this mind, we are able to develop our potentials and to be able to choose our direction of how are we going to lead our life. Okay? So, this first one, Everybody knows about these two verses. These are the, the most famous verses of, of, of Dhammapada. First is, mind precedes all mental states. Mind is their chief. They are all mind route. If with an impure mind a person speaks or acts, suffering follows him like the wheel that follows the foot of the ox. So sufferings right now and also in the future. So, you know about this, um, um, about this blind, blind arahat, right? He, 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 he was visiting the Buddha, but he was blind. So when he, when, when he was walking along, he killed a lot of insects and, and the other bhikkhus were complaining to the Buddha about him. And then um, the, and the Buddha asked this, people, did you really see them, did you really see them, see him killing all these insects? They said no. And the Buddha said, yeah, and Arahat do not have this kind of intention of killing. So even though he killed, he has killed because he was blind, he has no intention to kill, so he is not responsible for killings. 
And so if we are actually very mindful, we know. We know our behavior. We know how we speak. We know how we walk. We know how we sleep. We know how we eat. And we know how we deal with people or with situations if we are mindful enough. But if we are not, then we are just like this. With an impure mind, a person speaks or acts. Suffering follows him like the wheel that follows the foot of the ox. So we become the cart and we carry the, all these sufferings on our back, like the big boulders that I was talking about. So in this verse two, is that mind precedes all mental states. Mind is the chief. It's exactly the same, the first four sentences. But the last one is different. Happiness follows if with a pure mind, a person speaks or acts, pure and impure. Pure mind, that means not biased, mindful, balanced, focus, and very correct views. Happiness follows him like his never departing shadow. As long as we stand there, if there is light shining on, there is a shadow. It never leaves us because it's our body reflecting on the, the, the light shines on our body and it reflects onto the floor, on the ground. So the shadow never leaves us. And this tells us we have a potential. We have all the ingredients to cultivate happiness. But do we do that? A lot of, a lot of times we forget. We mix the wrong ingredients, right? Cook the wrong dish. Yeah, make the wrong muffins or cookies. Putting the wrong ingredients so the muffins are not muffins. <laughs> the cookies are not cookies. It's different. So, so the Buddha wanted us to know that the mind really actually is very, very important. And human, human beings, being, having a human life is so precious because we have this mind, human mind. Not for anything else, but for developing the potential to bring happiness to our oneself, to others in this very life, in the, in the future lives. And because of this, the Buddha always tells us we need to rely on ourselves. And only human beings can really be capable to do this, to rely on ourselves. He said, make an island for yourself. For yourself, the island is wholesome deeds. For a dog, it doesn't know which is wholesome, which is unwholesome. Everything comes because he is a dog. Like all, we, all, we constantly telling Goldie, you don't chase the meow meow, the meow meow, the cats, right? He does, she doesn't listen, she doesn't understand because she, she is a dog. And a dog is not accustomed, Goldie is not accustomed to see cats, to see male male here. So whenever she sees a male male, she would run and try to catch the male male or the bunny or the, the crows or the birds, whatever, because she's a dog. No, ma no matter how many sermons I keep telling her. <laughs> Goldie, you should not do this because this is, this is polam and there's no killing in here. You better behave, blah, 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 blah. And she just look at me with very innocent eyes. She said, Sifu, what are you talking about? I don't understand. Right? <laughs> so, so only human beings are capable to make an island for themselves. That means to cultivate wholesome deeds. So verse 
236. Actually, the whole, the whole story is co covers four verses. It's from 235 to 238, five verses. But I, I'm just picking out 236 and the next one. So it says 236 is make an island for yourself. Strive hard and become wise. Read of impurities and cleanse the stain. You shall enter the celestial abode of the noble ones. So celestial abode of the noble ones, that means heavenly beings. That means future life. So if we perform wholesome deeds this lifetime, and we, we, we try hard to become wise, that means what? Cultivate wisdom. When we have wisdom, we are able to actually purify ourselves. Through this cultivation of wisdom, cultivation of mindfulness, we are able to purify ourselves, filtering out all these pollutants. And we are able to scrub down the stain. When those stains are removed, the karma that we are carrying will be lighter. And when those karma are lighter, when we die, the wholesome karma will allow us to rise into heavenly beings, to become heavenly beings. So, so this is, this is, this is, oh, only human beings are capable to do this. Not a dog, not a turtle. Maybe they, sometimes they have, they have good, good, good deeds too, but very, very minimal and very sporadic. I mean, uh, one, one of, well, we had a wonderful dog before called Brianna, a rock violin, who never killed. Never, in the, in the, time, at the times that she was here. And uh, she even, even brought dead birds to the front, 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 front door so, so we could bury the, the birds. And she always let the birds eat her food first before she ate. And whenever after she ate, she always left a few nibbles of, of dog food there so the, the other birds could, could come and finish it off. But Brianna was a very rare dog, but still she was a dog. She understood a little bit what we, what, what we taught her, um, I think. And, uh, but it was, she was very rare, very, very rare. So, so I think it's only human beings are capable to do this, make an island for themselves and really know how to choose between wholesome and wholesome. And verse 238 is make an island for yourself strive hard and become wise, exactly the same. Rid of impurities and cleanse of stain, exactly the same. You shall not come again to birth and decay. So that means totally liberated from samsara, from cycles of rebirth. And uh, of course, this is not easy. Of course, this, has, this needs to take eons of practice. Um, but nevertheless, it's possible. Okay, so in human life, as I said, it's precious because we have this consciousness. And this consciousness, that's why we call ourselves what? Higher beings? <laughs> But at least we have this consciousness. And when we could really utilize this consciousness to, to, re, to, to change our life and to, you know, to, um, to cultivate, to un, unfold or to reveal the wholesome qualities that we all have inside. And because we have this consciousness and we human beings have this kind of intelligence, we are able to develop. 
an ability to, to reason, to investigate, to discriminate, and to to uh, and then develop this capacity to actually to practice um, or to to perceive or to receive to perceive a divinity and and spirituality. No other other animals can do that except uh, except human beings, right? So. Um, so we are we are actually very very blessed indeed, and we are actually v very very rare, and we are actually very very precious. And so, think of your life being very 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 valuable, and because of having this valuable life, we can strive forward to achieve the highest. Go look at the Buddha. Buddha was born as a man, and he achieved this highest goal in as a as a Buddha, totally, completely enlightened. So, this is what I have for human life is rare and precious from Dhammapada. So. Um, So what do you think? Is your life rare and precious? No? You don't think your life is rare? You don't think your life is precious? So why do you go on living? <laughs> yes, Lori? Sifu, when I first started um, coming to Polam, that was six years ago. Uh, Seven, eight, eight already. Yeah. Wow. Um, there was a period of time when I felt really bad about um, arriving here so late in my life. Oh. Yeah, and I would think, oh, if I only had. If I only had. If only, if only. And, I, and then I switched that switch, and I realized I still have time left. Yes. And how lucky I am. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and it is sinking in how very rare and how very precious it yeah. is. So. Yeah, great, great. Anybody else? How come you all are so quiet? Because you are in the TV? OK, phone king. Yes, uh, thank you, Sifu. Um, I am so uh, grateful that Sifu is always uh, repeating and repeating, uh, telling us. So boring, uh, <laughs> repeating no, all the time. No, no, no. <laughs> that quite a good person because I, I think from the teaching of the Buddha uh, in this way I at least my my own life is progressing mm. I see myself more and um, I feel I'm, I'm very lucky that we can um, um, hear uh, Sifu's teaching here online because mm. uh, this morning you compare the uh, the teaching in the East and the West. Uh, for me, my feeling is that in Hong Kong, we are very blessed mm. because uh, there seems to be so so many opportunities yes. to learn the uh, Buddhism, yeah. so many centers. Yeah. But in my experience, uh, actually, um, I didn't learn much. I didn't learn more because there's too much. <laughs> ah, too many, too and much, uh, yeah. Yeah, so in a way, uh, it's hard to focus. Mm. And uh, secondly, it's easy to be lazy. Uh, because it's always there. Yeah. It's so convenient. Yeah. So I, I, I 
myself, well, any time I feel happy or I feel I'm available, I could go to the center or now I, I could even uh, Zoom online. Even in Hong Kong, there's so many Zooms, okay? Yeah. But that's uh, make me feel um, then when compared with uh, all this uh, uh, CH, uh, well, our uh, yes, all we learning, then you are lucky because uh, in Chinese say there's a Honor, as they you know, <laughs> we all died in our comfort zone. Yeah. So I'm again lucky that, oh, I have the chance to, to join this group. It, it made me reflect on, hey, um, mm. don't take it for granted. Yes. And um, yeah, yeah, actually, actually, it's not that easy to learn the teaching of the Buddha, especially in a real Way. Mm. Uh, I, I really ask uh, this Dr. Yi Jing Dhamma. Yeah, Dhamma Vada. Uh, the first glance I look at it, oh, they look so simple. Yes. In black and white. Yeah. The word, the, even the word, is, the Chinese word is simple yeah. and seems easy to understand. Yeah. All right? But I'm so thankful that uh, Sifu leads us to explore deeper meaning of, mm. the, of the Buddha. Mm. And from deep learning, I feel that they are more down here, down to the earth. Yes, yes, yes. Down to the earth. Good. Forgive me, because I think I, 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 at the beginning, I learned from other courses, yeah. uh, other sutras, but maybe they are too big for me. Mm. Uh, like emptiness or what? Meditation. A meditation. Right? Yeah. I yeah. meditation. I see well, I'm so covered with ignorance, mm. so many mm. intuitions. Mm. But at, at least I gain an understanding that hey, um, yeah. I see the path. Yeah. I know that I gain wisdom. Yeah. Deep yeah. Time, yeah. Tiny time. At least I do well in this question mark, then I don't have to be scared of my Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, yeah. So I put out the second question to um, so you have already um, said that any plan to make it better, any plan to make your life better, is your life ray and precious, and any plan to make it better. So Tisa or Mali. Actually, I was going to uh, go back to. Nice to see you, uh, Sifu. Yeah. Um, very nice to see you. Um, I just want to go back to uh, the opportunity to uh, learn good teachings mm. uh, this rare. And um, I'm just grateful that you have given us that opportunity. That's, that's what I was trying to say. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so we are blessed. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, Wonderful indeed, it is to subdue the mind, so difficult to subdue, ever swift and wondering whatever it decides. A tame mind brings happiness, <laughs> as Claudio, 35. Thank you, Claudio. Um, so, yeah, so these are the two questions that I put to you. Um, maybe you could actually reflect, reflect upon yourself. Is your life rare and precious? And how rare, how precious? and how much you actually treasure it. And by that, you have any other plan? Any plan to make it better? That means make it more precious? You have any plan? Not just plan, but 
put it into practice, actions, not just talking, not, not a walkie-talkie, but a talkie-talkie, or walkie-walkie, <laughs> but not a walkie-talkie. Only, only know how to talk, but you need to walk. So walkie-talkie, talkie-walkie, or walkie-walkie, talkie-talkie. So, um, so you need to walk. You really need to put it into actions. So that's the most important. So I always say, no matter how, how well-versed you are in, in the literature, how hard you try, how hard you meditate, if during the daily life you are constantly rolling in anger, ill will, animosity, or craving, greed, or ignorance, then you are, no, you are going nowhere but to misery. So always reflect upon our own actions and start from there. Okay? So uh, how do you find this, uh, this exploring the Dhammapada? You like this? This we can go this way rather than going by verse and verse and story by story. No. Good. Okay, so I will see you next month then. Uh, I may, if I'm, I, I get, I get the next month uh, ready early enough. I may actually post out, post out those verses, and you can actually read those stories first, so you know the background of where that verse come from and um, then we can actually have more discussion. Uh, may, I ask, may I ask all of you who actually attend tonight um, to be prepared to share your feelings. You know, I'm sure you all have feelings about you know, teachings, but it's, it's nice to, to share. It's a kind of generosity too, okay? May these blessings extend to all that we with all the other living beings together will attain the Buddha way. May we wish more and more people will encounter the wise words of the Buddha, study them, practice them, and help themselves to break from all those entanglements and attain the final freedom, happiness, and peace.